Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure any time I get to speak yeah. God's word to anybody, whether it be to an audience or to my wife, my kids, or one-on-one -on -one with somebody. Uh, I am grateful for Pastor Rodney's foresight regarding this walk together towards Resurrection Sunday. I kind of see it for myself anyway as trying to start a habit. I think it's going to be long enough where I can start a habit where I'm not just excited about the risen Christ on Easter Sunday, but I'm excited about every day yeah. and that I'm willing to proclaim that all the time. And I think this is helping me get to that point in my life. So thank you very much for doing that. I don't think I've seen that done anywhere before, and it's a good idea. It's a very good idea, in fact. So without further ado, um, got a couple of questions I want you all to consider before I actually get into the, uh, the lesson this evening. And we're going to be talking about doubt. And we're going to be talking about how doubt not only uh, impacts us, but how it impacted those in Scripture. And so before I do that and read the, uh, the actual opening scripture, I want you to think about this question or a few questions. Has anyone ever doubted anything that you've ever said? Your proclamation. Think about how that made you feel. Has anyone ever doubted your abilities or doubted your authenticity as a Christian or as an individual? Anything. How, think about how that made you feel. Now, have you ever doubted what somebody has told you? Something that they were proclaiming and professing? And have you ever doubted them as an individual's uh, abilities or, or their authenticity as a Christian or a brother or a sister in Christ? Did they know that you were doubting them? Did you make it plain? Have you ever doubted yourself? Have you ever doubted your own abilities? and your authenticity as a follower of Christ. I see a lot of head nodding, so I'm, I think it's safe to assume that we all, at some point in time, struggle with doubt. <clears throat> Final question in this series is, have you ever doubted God? Have you ever doubted his word? Have you ever doubted his promises, his power, or his love for you? I, I can plainly tell you, yes, I have several times, unfortunately. And we're going to talk a little more about that tonight. Um, so for the purpose of tonight's lesson, I want to start off with a working definition of doubt. So we can all just kind of operate from the same sheet of music. Doubt, for the purposes of this evening, is not being able to come up with a confirmation or make a decision on something that somebody's either said or said is going to happen without gathering more information or having more evidence presented to us before we made that decision. Is that a good enough working definition for doubt? I know we can go all kinds of little rabbit holes with it, but for tonight we don't want to do that. We just want to focus on the fact that we probably need a little more information before we can say yay or nay on a definitive thing. Um, doubt can be influenced by several factors. Uh, two in particular are internal factors, stuff that we struggle with internally. Maybe it's our self-esteem, maybe it's the way we were brought up as children. It could be a lot of things. You know, life experiences, uh, they tend to alter the way we think about stuff and see things, perceive things. Maybe it's a, uh, something that uh, was said to us recently that just kind of changed everything. Something on the positive side, I hope, when it comes to God's word. And then there's the external things, stuff that happens, Pastor Roddy mentioned a few of them, politics has been huge influencing people's ability to think for themselves over the past several years and has just really started to taint our ability to critically think about anything, God's word in particular, unfortunately. Um, I was watching court TV the other night and there was a young man on trial for murder and the evidence against him was overwhelming, except they did not have a body. That was the one thing missing. You all know how that goes sometimes. When you can't produce a body, that has a lot of doubt associated with it. But the prosecuting attorney was good, very good in fact. So good 
that the defense attorney was extremely worried. He didn't think he was going to make it. And during his uh, last argument, he came up with an idea. He never told anybody, not his client, anybody else. He came up with this idea. He says, within the next minute, the person that you all believe that my client killed is going to walk through those court doors. So everybody's like, what? And they fix their eyes in the back of the courtroom, waiting for this individual to walk in. And he's counting it down on his watch. He's looking at it. 25 seconds, 35 seconds, 45 seconds. A minute hits, then a minute and five seconds hits. He says, okay, I misspoke. They're not going to walk through that door. He said, but all of you look back there, which tells me there's an element of doubt that you think my client did or did not commit that crime. And he talks directly to the jury. He says, now, when you go back and you deliberate, I want you to think about what you just did. And if you think hard enough and clear enough, I guarantee you should come up with a not guilty verdict. And he sits down. Every, uh, judge orders the uh, jury to leave and do what they need to do. They took a 30-minute lunch, and 35 minutes later, they came back, and they <laughs> had their verdict. And the judge say, you know, what, what's your verdict? The foreman stands up. He says, we find the defendant, blah, 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 guilty of murder. And the uh, defense attorney, he, he jumps up in amazement. He's like, what do you mean? He said, I saw you all look. You knew there was doubt. And the foreman says, yes, sir, we all did look back there at that door, waiting for that person to walk in. He said, everybody looked except for your client. So we got to take in information. We got to look at some of the obvious things around us a lot of times before we come up with a determination on what's right, what's wrong, and what we're going to cast doubt on. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 20. The book of John, chapter 20. And we're going to read uh, a couple verses, starting in verse 26, and we're going to read through verse 29. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Father, we uh, come to your throne this morning asking for you to prick our hearts we ask, Father, that you seek out all the things that keep us from being excited about the death, the burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, the one who took on the sins of the world, the sinless one, the one who died for my sins and for the sins for the rest of the world, Father. As we go through this lesson tonight, Father, help us to become excited every day for the fact that you, and only you, because of you and your grace that we all have hope through your son Jesus and that we need to tell everyone about that, the whole world about that great news, Father. We ask these things in the name of your son this evening. Amen. Uh, just a few more things. The Bible has a lot of history about people doubting. So don't feel alone. We talked about our, our series of questions earlier. Go all the way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve doubted God's word. They listened to somebody. Remember that external force I was talking about? They had an external force come in and tell them something just slightly different from what God said. And they ended up casting doubt on everything that they knew was right at the time. You also have uh, Abraham and Sarah who doubted the fact that God was going to carry out his promises of making them a great nation through them. And they ended up making some crazy decisions and doing some crazy things. I asked my wife about it. She said, don't even think about it. You don't need a nation, nor do you need any more kids. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. But 
Uh, Abraham and Sarah doubted the promise of a son. <coughs> the Israelites, I mean, you read throughout the whole, pretty much the entire Old Testament is talking about the Israelites having doubt. They doubted God and what he was doing, what he wanted to do. They doubted the, the uh, leader that he put over them, Moses, right. several times to the point where Moses said, you know what, why did you call me to these people? Take me now. I don't even want to deal with them anymore. Remember that? Uh, somebody doubting what you say? Yeah, that's, that, that, that will have a, a huge impact on you and the way that you are able to carry out the business for God. The New Testament. John the Baptist had some doubt. When he got arrested and was getting ready to be beheaded, he said, uh, is, he really the, is he really the one that I was supposed to usher in? And Jesus understood that doubt. And he went back and told him, or had word sent back and said, yeah, yes, you saw what was happening. You know all the things that were prophesied about me. Clear your doubts. All the disciples doubted at one time. Right. All of them. Not just Thomas, all of them. <coughs> the new uh, converts, even after Pentecost, the new converts doubted. They kept going back and, and, and listening to the ones that were saying, the Mosaic law was the way of doing business. This new Christ thing, nah, that's not, no, you need to follow the law. They doubted what Paul and all the other apostles had already taught them. And that's why we have all these letters combating these issues, these false teachings, and these uh, things of uh, sticking with tra uh, traditions. You also have Timothy, who doubted himself. He doubted his leadership abilities. And Paul had to you know, encourage him. And of course, still today, we have doubt. So we're going to talk about this doubt thing. I hope you can see, uh, if for all those who are PowerPoint police, I break every law there is when it comes to PowerPoint presentation. I have absolutely zero PowerPoint etiquette because I just want to make sure it's there. So hopefully you can read it. I can barely read it from back here with my glasses on, but that's okay. We've already established the working definition for doubt, and we already established the fact that doubting is part of our human nature. I kind of disagree with the fact that Thomas doubted. Based on my uh, definition, he outright rejected the fact that Jesus was alive. Do you remember what happened when the uh, apostles told him? Now, they all were together when Jesus first showed up. He wasn't there. So the, uh, when they told him, they, they proclaimed the risen Christ, he was like, until I see it, I will not believe it. So he rejected it. He didn't even doubt. He didn't say, all right, give me some more information. Now what happened? Talk to me. He, he, didn't, he didn't say that. He said, I, I, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Don't play me. Thomas rejected that claim, and he wanted proof. And this is not the first time. If you think about Thomas, when Jesus said, I'm going back to the Father, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. What did Thomas say? He asked the question, hey, wait a minute. He says, I really don't understand what you're talking about. Where are you actually going, and what are you actually going to be doing? Because I kind of had the understanding that you were going to be here doing things with us. Right. And Jesus says, no. <laughs> Where I'm going, believe me, you need me to go there. You just sit back and do what you need to be, do uh, need to be done, and everything will work out fine. The one thing I, I like about Thomas is he was honest about the way he felt. He was always honest. He didn't try to play games with anybody. If I, if I don't know, I don't know. I'm not going to act like I know. I, I'm going to ask you. And if I don't believe it, I'm not going to sit back and say, hmm, yeah, okay, and then walk away with all this doubt. He doesn't do that. Maybe Thomas is kind of like what we talked about. We do business sometimes. We question God's promises, we question his purposes, his timing, his goodness, his grace, his love. Normally when I have the opportunity to speak, I normally end my uh, lesson with a testimony, but my testimony is gonna come right now because I think it's important to establish the fact that not only do I doubt, but I just recently doubted all those things about God. I took what man had to say, and I took my circumstances, and I applied them, and applied them so deeply within my spirit that I kind of discounted everything I knew about God 
and everything I know God had done and is going to do and continues to do. You, most of you already know my diagnosis with the leg and the recent uh, spot on my lung that they found and the recent uh, VA doctor said, you know, you got bleed, blood in your urine, bladder cancer. I mean, that's the first thing out of his mouth. With the spot on my lung and, and, and then my uh, oncologist, when she took the scan of my leg and chest area, she's like, you know, this, this thing on your lung is metastasized. So all these key words started digging a hole in my spirit. And I started thinking, I got cancer throughout my body. What in the world is going on? What, God, what you got going on? How could you do this to me? Didn't tell Lisa, but then she started feeling it. And I started seeing her feeling it. Uh, she went and walked the dogs one Saturday morning. It was a Sunday morning, Saturday morning. And uh, actually she walked one of the dogs. The other dog stayed with me. When I'm sick, my dog likes to stick around me. That, that's loyalty right there. So he and I, when they left, he and I got on, the, I got on my knees and he got next to me and we prayed and we, and we wailed, we, we yelled, we screamed, we cried out to God. And when Lisa got home, I just walked up to her and grabbed her and we just cried together. Within a matter of a couple of days, we got so down in our spirit over some words that were said and we just forgot about God, the power of God. How could we? Well, how could the Israelites, after they saw him get him out of Egypt, he came in the cloud through the day, fire by night. He did everything for them, manna, quail, all that. And they still doubt it. So I don't feel so bad about my doubt. I just feel bad that I allowed my spirit to be so dampened, knowing the righteousness of God. There is my testimony. Doubt is not the same as denial. So I'm not going to let my uh, doubt get me down because I can always come back up from that. It's not deny. I didn't outright deny the fact that God is powerful. I didn't deny the fact that, uh, you know, he can heal whatever he wants to heal, when he wants to heal it, how he wants to heal it. John needed to have a better understanding, like I said earlier, when Jesus said he wanted to leave. I needed a better understanding. And I'm going to tell you how I got that better understanding. It didn't come from a doctor. It didn't come from any more scans. It didn't come from worry, of course. What actually got my spirit back going is something Lisa did. She felt the urge to start a prayer list for me and about, what, four other people at the time? And it ended up being a list of uh, maybe 20, 25 people now around the world being prayed for. And some of the stories that I got back made mine minimal in comparison. Brain cancer, you know, inoperable cancers, stuff that just you know, nobody's ever heard of. And, and, and then to top it off, I'm watching TV one late night and I see these kids at St. Jude's and other places, babies with cancer. I'm like, oh my goodness, I could not imagine my little boy or any of my nieces or my grandson, for that matter, going through cancer treatments. And I'm like, you need to slow it down, buddy. You got it going on. So it, it took my mind off of my issues and my sorrows and it put it, it where it needed to be and that was to praise God and to pray to God on behalf of others. So that, that is my testimony. Uh, and that's the end of it. Um, Jude 22. I don't know if you've ever read through Jude. But if you get towards the end of Jude, in verse 22 it says, And have mercy on those who doubt. Right. We are to have mercy on those who doubt. I remember I was, uh, I had a bunch of uh, international kids over to my house at the, at, um, after a, a school function or something. And one of the dads sponsor dads came to pick up his, his uh, sponsored child. Uh, he was a Japanese uh, boy, he was a senior, and the dad asked him, the sponsor dad, uh, so have you learned anything that's gonna get uh, rid of that evolution stuff in your head? And he said it just like that. And the you know, young man says, no, I, I, that's all I grew up with. And he says, I'm learning. You need to get it out of your head, stop doubting God. 
I mean, in just that way. And I said, yo, oh, wait a minute, man, hold on. I said, this guy has been taught evolution for 18 years of his life. That's all he's ever been taught. Three months here with us is not going to change that, at least not the way you want it to change. It can change, but we gotta, we got to do it the right way. You want to turn people off? Put your, express your doubt in such a, a way, in a manner, that's going to turn them off to God. We should never do that. We look at Jude, and that implies that doubt is not the opposite of faith. Everybody we talked about had some degree of faith. Some were considered righteous, in fact, but they doubted. They doubt it. Certainty is not required to have faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We all can quote that. We walk by faith, not by sight. So because I don't see it, doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. And if I have doubt about it, that doesn't, shouldn't have to uh, bring my faith into question. I still believe. I still believe. I believe there's a God. I'm not going to just totally say there's no God. There's no, no risen Christ. None of that matters without certainty. How we ought to approach people with their doubts, it, it tells us we gotta have patience with them, we gotta have mercy, we gotta extend grace to them. With everything that we do, any time that you wanna go out and minister to anybody, those things should be up front. Mercy, grace, patience, all those things. Everything motivated by what? Love, there you go. by love. You can't love God and be mean to somebody talking about you are gonna bring them to Christ. It doesn't work out that way. It doesn't work out that way. How we ought to approach people with our doubts and with their doubts is the same way we approach them with their sins. Rather than properly labeling them, which a lot of people do. I remember I was talking to a lady one time, and she said, I got a half-brother, Adrian. I just met him. How old was she, like 75 at the time? And she says, I went to visit him, and I wanted to minister to him. She says, but I can't. I said, well, why not? He curses way too much. I said, what? Not surprised that she said it. I'm surprised that she used it as an excuse not to minister. She didn't even want to go see him anymore. I said, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but I said, do you realize before I came to Christ, when it says curse like a sailor, my picture was there in dress blues. That was, that's me. That was me. And I said, the very people <coughs> who got me to come to Christ or rededicate myself to Christ were the very ones, the first thing they addressed was my mouth. They said, when you come around us, you don't do that. They set up a little box in my office. In fact, my, my nickname during that time frame in my Navy was, was ABM, Angry Black Man. That's what they called me because I was mad at everybody, mad at everything. And they said, when you come in this office, if you say anything out of sorts, dollar. Well, my wife hates for me to give away money, and I hate to give away money, so guess what I didn't do when I walked in that office? Curse. And that started me thinking. And over time, I cursed less and less and less until it just went away. Because somebody took the time to address my bad mouth. And it helped a lot of other things. My anger came down. A lot of stuff transitioned when people take the time to work and disciple you. You got to come alongside people when you want disciples. Right. You can't just say, I want you to be a good Christian and then walk off. And that's what she was trying to do. Right. So we can't label folks. We can't count them off. What we ought to do is extend care to them, just like the doctors extend care to me and everybody else that's dealing with this cancer right now. You may or may not be able to solve their problem or help them out. We don't know, but you got to plant the seed. You start sowing that seed. Right. That's your job. Okay. That's what we need to do. Now, from doubting to proclaiming, in chapter uh, 20 of John, verse 28, we have this right here. He says, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. This is the very first time anybody has ever addressed Jesus as my God. The first time. That's, that is huge. That is huge. Jesus' physical revelation changed everything and everybody. Everybody that was close to him was changed. Thomas and the rest of the disciples saw things differently. They start to finally understand everything that he was talking about and had talked about. They started to put two and two together. 
He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He has risen. We have hope. We know how to live the resurrected life. Now, let's go out and proclaim it to everybody else. They understood their mission now a lot better than when he first told them, go out and preach the gospel to all the world. And it also said that some of them doubted. Even after that, some of them doubted. But now they're starting to get a better understanding. I love this part because in verse 29, Jesus also says to him, Thomas, because... You have seen me, you have believed. He was able to see him physically. We haven't. We, have, we didn't get that opportunity. Right. But that's okay. It says, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet still believe. Right. We are that. And you know Jesus prayed for all of us. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for all future believers, which we were a part of that. And those prayers have been answered in so many ways by so many people that you and I have all went out and touched and talked to and worked with and discipled and prayed for, those prayers have been answered. But we got a lot more work to do, people. That's right. We got a lot more souls that need to be saved. And I got a, a, another friend of mine who is just, every time I talk to her, every time I talk to her, she gets on the subject of immigration. Every time. And I'm like, why are you so been up on this immigration thing. I said, first of all, America's not the only one that has an immigration problem. This is a global issue. Uh, in fact, Britain just passed a law that says we can't take anymore. And the citizens were outraged. So the prime minister now is starting to work with France and other nations in Europe to try to come up with a way to deal with immigration without just saying, okay, just stay out there in the water and die. Uh, and I respect that. I respect that. But what I did tell, I said, you know, I'm not saying that it's okay that everybody just floods into America. That's not what I'm saying. But as a Christian, I am more concerned with their soul for eternity than where they reside temporarily. America is going to dissolve one day. This is all going to go away one day. And I'm not so comfortable with America that I'm like, that's the only thing that I care about right now when I've got people who need their souls saved. That's, right. that's, that's, my, that's my biggest thing. So she didn't have anything to say about it, but I don't think I convinced her. We'll find out in the next conversation, and I'll update you how she feels. Um, we can learn a lot from Thomas, a few things anyway. The one thing is that's true for every one of us. Jesus is going to meet you exactly where you are spiritually. He's going to meet you wherever you are, whatever you need to get you over that hump. He's going to provide that to you. You got to be open to it though. You have to be open to it. Even when we're struggling in our faith. When I got down on my knees that morning, it was just amazing. I, I could not believe my dog was right. It's like he was praying with me. Normally he's like, give me a treat, give me a treat. What are we, what are we doing? Where are we going? What? He didn't even want to go walk that morning. I don't understand why, because he's always wanting to go walk. He says, no, I think I got some business here with my dad. I need to stick around. And we yelled and wept, and that changed the situation for me. It, it lifted my spirits a little bit. I was able, you know how you get that nice cry out and then you feel better? You just do. It's kind of like, you know, when you get sick and you sweat a lot and then you feel a little better or you throw up and you feel a little bit better. Same thing when it comes to your spirit. When I'm struggling in your faith, Jesus is there. Jesus understands all of our questions, all of our doubts, all of our fears. He understands all that. He had them. That anxiety in the garden, sweating blood. I've never seen that before, but I've seen something close. I don't know if Lisa's ever told you, but when she gets stressed, she gets blood spots. And I, and I look at her arm or her back, I said, well, I said, did I pinch you or something? What is that on your back? What is that? She said, oh, that's a stress spot, I think. I said, that's kind of like what Jesus was, was going through or similar. I understand that a bit. Your nerves can really do a, a number on you. The human side of him got to him. He is ready to guide us in our faith just as he led Thomas. He, was, he gave Thomas exactly what he needed. Hey, feel, touch right here. Is this what you need to see? Is this what you need to feel? Touch right there, that's okay. 
Come here, come here, come. I, I, I want you to be certain. I don't want you to have any more doubt because you know what? I, I got something for you to do. And Thomas became a powerful influencer, a powerful influencer for the church. Thomas was radically changed that day along with the rest of the disciples. And the resurrected Christ can radically change anybody else. That's some good news. That is something we need to proclaim every day. The truth and power of the resurrection can transform even the greatest skeptic. And I'm sure I was one at one point. Maybe some of you. I don't know. I don't know. Some reflection on the resurrection. And like I said, I'm glad we're marching together towards Resurrection Sunday as a congregation. Hopefully we can get more people engaged and, uh, and, and do this thing as a community. Are you open to hear from Jesus? Are you open to have him reveal to you what needs to be dealt with? When I was doing all that stuff as a, as a young sailor who didn't have a care in the world, all I wanted to do was tell people how I felt. And if you got on my nerves, you got it. You got it. My students included. All of them got it. <coughs> but somebody said, it, that, you know what, we need to address that. And Jesus led them to me. They didn't have to do it, but they felt moved enough to do it. Just like Lisa felt moved to do this prayer list. That's all spiritual, divine intervention. That's all, I mean, nothing happens by chance. God said, this is time for me to address this. Man, you've been doing this way too long. I need you to close your mouth and start talking like you got some sense. And he addressed it. Are you ready to be addressed? Are you open to moving from doubting to a life of full submission? Not cursing is good. But I didn't go all the way to full submission for a number of years. And I don't even think I'm at full submission today. I'm at some level of submission, but not full submission, because I'm still human. I still battle my human nature. But I want to be able to be used whenever, wherever, however, and to whoever God wants to use me. And that's submission. That's that submission Christ is telling you, you, you got to give it up. You got to take up your cross. Deny yourself. Move out with the marching orders. Are you willing to start proclaiming who Jesus really is and what he's done and what he's continuing to do? This prayer list has got me excited all over again. I'm ready, and, and, and Lisa and I have just, we, we went with somebody just this morning, a good friend of ours. Just this morning, he went to have his appendix pulled out because He's got cancer in his ab area. We met him there at 5.30. We went back to uh, get him or see how he was doing at what, 1.30, I think it was, 1.30. And they said, he wasn't there. I said, what do you mean he's not there? We, we left him here. He's got to be here. And they said, no, sir, he's been discharged. I said, what? I said, I didn't know he took your appendix out and then sent you home an hour later. I said, man, medicine's good. Little did I know. We went to his house and his wife came out teary-eyed. She says they couldn't remove his appendix because the cancer was so aggressive and so vast in his abdomen area it started attaching to other organs. They would have to start removing his bowels and intestines and everything else and they weren't prepared to do that. So they got a sample of his tissue and they sent it away. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking. But. What he told me, he says, Adrian, he said, no matter what, I win. No matter what, I win. I said, you're right. You're, you're, you're so right. He says, I'm going to be with the Lord if he calls me home. He said, if I stay here, okay, but if not, I win regardless. The Lord wants to meet you today and address all of your questions and all of your doubts, whatever they are. Because we all got them. We have already established that. We got some doubt somewhere. Yes. At some point, we're going to have to have those answered for us. Or well, we should at least try. Investigate. This is the best place to go, right here. There you go. This, this is where I go now. If I got a question about anything, <coughs> the last thing I'm going to do is ask somebody else. I'm going here first. 
This is where I'm going for anything. How do I deal with this, that, or the other? And I go to the Bible because it's basic instructions before leaving life is what I got. And I used to do prison ministry and I met this guy who was out of prison. He says, being incarcerated brought me life. That was his way of using it. I was like, oh, I like that. That's good. That's real good. Will God's word transform you? Will he change you from a skeptic to an evangelist? That's the question we need to ask ourselves every single day, not just on Resurrection Sunday, but every single When you get up in the morning, where am I going to evangelize at? Who am I going to evangelize to? And what am I going to evangelize about? That's right. Where am I going to sow some seed?